what makes a city eternal? To answer this question, let's peel back the layers of time to the year 248 AD to witness an epic event in the history of Rome. For in this year, the Romans celebrated 1,000 years of their city's history. Now, the empire at this point had seen better days. But the emperor, Philip the Arab, desired for his city to enjoy the fruits of imperial domination and longevity by reinitiating the secular games. Secular as in happening every 100 years, or cyclum. Beast fights, chariot races, gladiatorial combat, religious sacrifices, and music competitions erupted throughout the city for several days. But we will not focus on this millennium anniversary or the crises the Romans had to face after the wine cleared their systems. Instead, we must peel back more layers of time to April 21st, 753 BC, the date many Romans believe their city was founded. What makes a city eternal? Is it the breathtaking monuments which have weathered the storms of time, impressively towering over us still to this day? Is it the legends and mythology which have captivated the psyche, the fears, and the imaginations of readers and listeners for centuries? Is it the history of the inhabitants themselves, the kings, the elites, the soldiers, the farmers, the shopkeepers, or the slaves whose stories, like a kaleidoscope, gives us a blindingly colorful collage of everyday life and a distant yet relatable past? Or is it the city's cultural influences which many of us have inherited today, such as language, political structures, social norms, or religious practices? There are endless factors which propel a city to legendary status, but in all honesty, it comes down to one thing, a good story. And to put it frankly, Rome's rise and continuous transformation is probably one of the best stories you'll ever hear. That is what makes the city of Rome eternal. Don't believe me? Why don't you come and find out yourself? Our story will span three continents, Africa, Asia, and Europe, and covers 2,000 years of history, from Rome's inception as a backwater in central Italy, to its apogee as the most powerful polity in the Mediterranean and the Near East, to its rump state status clinging on to former glory as the Middle Ages came to a close. This will truly be an adventure you won't forget. So let's start at the beginning. No, not that one. Greatness comes from small beginnings. Easy to say when you can thumb through a history book or pull up a Wikipedia article on the history of a famous civilization. But what was there at Rome's beginning? Or better yet, how did the Romans themselves conceptualize their own origin? We get snippets of these through Roman historians and poets, particularly during the late Republic and early Empire, when Rome had become the true arbiter of the Mediterranean. Resting on their laurels, I guess they were wondering, gee, how do we become so great? Surely there is some elaborate mythological story behind our grand ascendancy. We must descend from a heroic people or some type of deity, right? Right? In the first century BC, Roman historian Marcus Terentius Varro synthesized various histories and chronologies to come up with the founding date of the city of Rome. April 21st, 753 BC. But that's using our Christian calendar. To the Romans, their calendar was based off the founding of the city of Rome. So it will be year 1 AUC or Ab Urbe Condita, or year 1 since the founding of the city. For more context, to the ancient Romans, our year of 2024 would be 2777 AUC or 2,777 years since the founding of Rome. Our writers in the first century BC, such as Ovid, Virgil, Livy, Dionysius of Halicarnassus, tell us of how the Romans imagined their city's origin and their own ancestry. 
One of the earliest writings we have concerning Rome's foundation comes from the Annals written by Quintus Fabius Pictor, often considered the first Roman historian in the 3rd century BC. Pictor's work doesn't survive, but is referenced by later historians such as Livy and Plutarch. Likewise, an ancient Greek named Diocles of Paparathus wrote even earlier than Pictor, sometime in the 4th century BC, with Pictor using his writings as a source. So how did all these historians and poets envision Rome's start and its rise to domination? These writers and the Romans at large believed in several origin myths regarding their birth as a people. A people, they believed, who excelled in duty, piety, and warfare. The ancient Greeks typically attributed the founding of famous cities around the Mediterranean and beyond to heroic figures. The city of Rome was no different. Legends abound of famous Greeks founding colonies near the vicinity of Rome such as Evander and Diomedes. In fact, we know of two dozen founding myths for the city of Rome, formulated by both Greeks and Romans. But the most famous of these legends is the one of Aeneas, a Trojan prince first mentioned by Homer and further mythologized through the years as becoming the father of the Romans. Dionysus of Halicarnassus tells of a Trojan prince named Aeneas who with other Trojan refugees, after years of wandering the Great Sea, landed in central Italy. Once ashore, a Trojan woman named Roma demanded that Aeneas burn the ships and settle in the area, a fertile plain which would later become known as Latium. Thus, the community in which they built became Roma. Aeneas' story was further fleshed out and took on more symbolic depth in Virgil's magnum opus the Aeneid. Aeneas, son of the goddess Venus or Aphrodite, and a Trojan noble named Anchises escaped the fall of Troy with a group of survivors and sailed through the Mediterranean to find a new home. After a few adventures, including a tragic romance with Queen Dido in North Africa, he was led by fate to settle his people in central Italy. Aeneas was welcomed by the local king named Latinus and soon after married the king's daughter named Lavinia. He would then found the city of Lavinium in her honor. Aeneas' son from his first marriage, Ascanius, founded the legendary city of Alba Longa. The Trojan expats would intermarry with the locals, creating the Latin people, and Aeneas' dynasty would rule the area for centuries, until a disturbing event happened. Male twins are born to a grieving mother who knows that, soon enough, they will be subjected to a horrible fate. Her father, King Numitor of Alba Longa, had just deposed his younger brother, Amulius. To stamp out the competition, Amulius ruthlessly slew the king's sons and commanded the king's daughter, Rhea Silvia, to swear a vow of chastity by becoming a Vestal Virgin. But Rhea's misfortunes don't stop there, for Mars, the god of war, had his way with her and she thereafter became pregnant. After Rhea delivered twin boys, Amulius mercilessly imprisoned her. But this wanton act of cruelty wasn't the end for the brothers, for fate had different plans. One of the servants of the new king took pity on the boys and put them in a basket so the Tiber River could carry them somewhere, anywhere. But here, the god of the Tiber, Tiberinus, with his calm currents, guided the boys to be washed ashore as a she-wolf approached. The wolf caused them no harm, quite the contrary, she nursed them. The wolf is revered by the Romans as blessed by Mars because of this event. Tiberinus will later rescue their mother, Rhea, and marry her. Romulus and Remus were later raised by a shepherd's family until they reached adulthood, when they embarked on a quest of vengeance against their great uncle Amulius. They returned to Alba Longa, killed Amulius, 
and restored their grandfather Numitor to the throne. After mission accomplished, they went back to the place where it all started, the bank where they were rescued by the wolf, to build and rule a city on their own. This area encompassed seven hills, each with a name. Romulus envisioned the city resting on the Palatine Hill, and Remus the Aventine Hill. The brothers quarreled over who was right. Hmm, how to settle this? Oh yes, let's watch for bird signs. They turned to augury, which is a type of divination or prophetic interpretation of an omen. Remus saw six birds land on his hill first, and Romulus saw twelve land on his. Remus argued, since he saw the sign first, he won. And Romulus argued that since he saw the most birds, he won. The feud continued until one day, as Romulus was erecting a barricade around his hill, Remus mockingly jumped over the wall, teasing his brother over his shoddy craftsmanship. Angered by this trolling, Romulus hastily killed his brother, Remus. Livy tells us the date of Remus' death was April 21st, 753, the same date as Rome's legendary founding. Starting off with fratricide. If this isn't foreshadowing, then I don't know what is. The actual founding of Rome and its early history are poorly documented and shrouded by myth and legend. As mentioned earlier, most of our writings of this period date from the 3rd century to the 1st century BC, hundreds of years removed from the asserted foundation date. According to archaeological evidence, the earliest dwellers of the Eternal City date way back to the 10th century BC on the Palatine Hill, where Romulus supposedly founded Rome. Around the 8th century, we see small-scale urban development, with local inhabitants creating villages on each of the seven hills, draining the swamps which separated these hills, and eventually consolidating them to make one united city. This process of uniting disparate villages into one single city-state is called Senecism. This union could have been a response to the aggressions from their Italic neighbors on the Latian plain, or the result of an urbanization program imposed by a dominant foreign power, such as the Etruscans. More about them in another video. Additionally, around the 9th and 8th centuries BC, we find early fortifications and grave sites in the region that would later become Rome. The stories of Romulus and Remus adrift on a river within a basket echo the stories of Moses, Sargon of Akkad, and Oedipus, who were all exposed at birth raised by non-biological parents and would become leaders in their own right. Another tidbit, the she-wolf who nursed Romulus and Remus could have been a prostitute since she-wolf or lupa was also Roman slang for a female sex worker. During the late Republic and Empire, the Romans would celebrate Rome's foundation day every April 21st in the Parilia festival. Parilia observed the god Pales a rustic patron deity of shepherds and livestock. The celebration of this festival connects to the country upbringing of Romulus and Remus. Another possible source of Rome's establishment is evidenced by its strategic location at the intersection of a salt trade route. This road was called the Via Salaria, the Salt Way, possibly the oldest road in Roman history. The Sabines, a neighboring Italic tribe which the legendary Romulus and his followers had a rather tense relationship with, would extract salt from the marshes of the Tiber and trade the product with other Italic tribes, including the powerful Etruscans. Salt was a crucial commodity in ancient times for food preservation and seasoning. The Via Salaria linked Rome with their Sabine neighbors and the wider Italian peninsula. But how did these two tribes get along? And how did their conflict and eventual union it transformed the cultural, religious, and political outlook of the burgeoning Eternal City. That's the topic of the next video. Contemporary Roman historian David Potter says, the foundation of Rome was accomplished with a spectacular act of violence. Suffering, duty, endurance, violence, 
these are some themes that arise when examining the foundation myths of Aeneas as well as the brothers Romulus and Remus. Did the Romans see themselves as inheriting these characteristics in later centuries? Is this how they envisioned their ancestors? How they justified their conquests and subjugations of other tribes, kingdoms, and even empires? Did they use these stories to explain their own social discontent and class conflicts, their bitter political feuding and infighting, and their bloody civil wars? Find out possible answers to these questions as we continue our story of Rome. What makes a city eternal? Maybe it's the colorful yet brutal tales of its first peoples that enliven our imaginations and drive us to want to discern fact from fiction of these early accounts. In this intellectual exercise, we are in fact writing our own history of Rome, which itself is an age-old tradition. Roman history is always being rewritten, and always has been, says classicist Mary Beard. So let's see what history we can write of the Eternal City that can make for one good story. If you want more Rome, check out this video to see how Roman society transformed to meet new challenges in its later period. Like, share, subscribe. See you next time.